Today we're going to go over Nutrition 101, just a basic nutrition course for everybody. And I'm going to cover two main questions today. And the first question is probably what I hear the most out of a typical day at work. And that's, what do I eat, first of all? What to eat? What do I eat? And the second question we're going to go over is, when and how do I eat? So there's two questions we're going to go over. I'm going to start with the first one, what to eat. And first, the best segue for this is going just for the current standards, our current food guide pyramid, and what um, our government says that we should eat. Well, if we go by the US government, we should have six to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. And that should be the staple of our diet today. And fats, healthy fats, should be at the very, very top, used very, very sparingly. Okay, so if you really want to know the exact mechanism of uh, how you should eat, you really just need to flip the entire thing over. And it's pretty sad that the US government will give you a food guide pyramid that's the exact opposite of health. And that's exactly what they want. But when you look at this, bread, cereal, rice, pasta, and then you see dairy up there as well. I mean, these are made by dairy and agricultural subsidies. They're basically paying the government so the government will recommend these foods to help their industry. So it's a payoff. It's not based on science, never has been. And so when you look at actually the real food guide pyramid we should really go for, you're basically flipping the top and the bottom section over. So in the bottom, you're gonna have healthy fats and vegetables. On the top, you're gonna have your grains and sugars. Now again, Tim O'Shea kind of brought this up earlier and talked about this whole grain thing. It is not FDA regulated. You can say 100% whole grain. You can say whole grain. All that means is that they started with a whole grain kernel and then they could do whatever the heck they want with it. So that, the whole grain thing does not mean anything. Wheat thins are whole grains, okay? I mean, it, it does not matter. This is gonna fall. So again, you're looking at healthy fats, fruits, you're looking at healthy meats, and at the very top, breads, pastas, cereals. And so, when we first look at one section, let's look at fat, because fat's a very uh, intriguing topic now. When you focus on eating a whole unprocessed foods, avoiding grains, sugars, which is the precursor to disease, healthy fats include a lot of things. Coconuts, avocados, olive oil, grass-fed butter, raw nuts and seeds, you know, fruits and vegetables, but they really should be, healthy fat should be about 50 to 75% of your daily caloric intake. And a lot of those foods are gonna be kind of mix and match. For example, if you eat a nice uh, grass-fed steak, that's gonna have both protein and fat. So it's not just these fat guidelines here, but ideally when you look at all your food, 50 to 75% should be healthy fats. And we're gonna go over why in a second. But again, I just wasn't quite aware that Timoshe was gonna go that much more into nutrition from looking at his topic. So we're gonna be kind of covering the same material a little bit, but the fats you gotta avoid, obviously, are your processed vegetable oils. And these are very high in omega-6, pro-inflammatory oils. Seed oils, uh, canola, sunflower, safflower, all of those oils are absolutely toxic. Polyunsaturated fats, not good. Trans fats. So anytime you see like on this uh, Skippy peanut butter label, hydrogenated vegetable oil, that's a big no-no. And again, they only use that to extend shelf life. And that's also why Skippy has that nice little texture. You know, you buy the organic stuff and you got the oil coming up to the top. It's not the same, but again, it's real versus just completely fake made in a scientific lab. And we obviously don't want that. And so another beneficial fat that we got to look into is omega-3s. And omega-3s are so confusing for so many people because they think that they can just take an omega-3 supplement regardless of what kind and be fine. But you got to realize there's three omega-3s that we're talking about. You have marine-based omega-3s, and you have plant-based omega-3s, completely different. So your marine-based, so what you get from wild fish and stuff like that, is your EPA and DHA. Plant-based omega-3s is ALA. So they're very, very different, and I'm gonna propose to you that the ALA is not important. It's the EPA and DHA that's important. So if you're taking a supplement right now, make sure it has those two in there for sure. ALA is not going to be important for supplementation because we get it enough in our diet. And just to show you what's going on here, this is vital for brain health. 
greater than 90% of your omega-3 fats in your brain is DHA. Over 90%, not ALA, not EPA, this is DHA. 30% of the entire fat mass of your prefrontal cortex is DHA. And what's interesting is that all your other omega-3s in the nervous system, in the structural parts of your brain, you're gonna have trace amounts of both EPA and ALA. Very trace amounts there. So it's almost all DHA consisting of that for the health of your brain. So ALA, and this is an interesting study, this guy named Nils Holm, he's a leading scientist in omega-3 phospholipids, and he did a study. He took, uh, he had patients go on either a plant-based omega-3, ALA, or marine-based EPA and DHA. And what he did is he fed them a supplementation, and then he measured their blood levels of that omega-3 phospholipid, and just to see how long it would stay in the blood. And what he found was that your EPA and DHA, they stayed in your bloodstream at high levels for over three days. And that's a long time. Conversely, ALA stayed in there for less than 10 hours. So you're talking less than 10 hours versus over three days, and there's a reason for that. ALA is simply a source of energy. It's, it's, it's food. EPA and DHA are structural elements of our brain, like we talked about. And so when your body is taking that long to distribute it, your body's taking that three to four days to distribute it, to redistribute it, to make sure it's part of the structural elements of the body, whereas ALA gets absorbed very, very fast. So they're completely different physiologically, scientifically, everything. And ALA, you're gonna have, they're different carbon lengths. So ALA is the shortest, then you have EPA, then you have DHA. So they're all different structures, and if you change the structure, it's gonna change the function of these. And so, again, when you look at this, a myth is that we can get all our omega-3s from vegetarian sources, and it's not true. It's absolutely not true. They're not interchangeable. EPA and DHA, they're essential. Your body can't make them. ALA is essential as well, but we get it in nuts, seeds. You get it in so many different varieties that it's really not necessary to supplement with ALA. But EPA and DHA, you have to. And so, when you're looking at the structures here, you got the ALA on the bottom, the DHA on the top, and you see how those carbon chains get longer because they're just completely different. And a lot of vegans, a lot of vegetarians will say, well, you can make a, you know, if I consume ALA, that can convert to EPA and DHA in the body. And that's actually true. There is a chemical reaction that happens. The problem is that only 0.1 to 0.5% of ALA is actually converted to DHA. So you're not getting nearly enough, you actually have to supplement from outside sources. So when you're looking at different dosages, because I'm gonna tell you exactly what type of calories you should get from this, dosage-wise, they don't really, it's really hard to find a, a healthy dosage of how much omega-3s. It's all different regarding on the reference you're looking at, but if you're doing it for heart health, if you have high triglycerides, if you have depression, there's different dosing you can take into account. I would probably go towards the more the higher end of these doses, but again, you're kind of just going to have to experience for yourself on that. But I would recommend 1,000 to, you know, upwards of 2,000 a day. And so transitioning, when we're talking about healthy meats, healthy proteins, it's got to be high quality. It's got to be grass-fed organic meats. Make sure it has no hormones, no pesticides, wild fish, organic pastured eggs. And when you're talking about how much someone should be taking of protein, it's about one gram per kilogram of lean body mass. And that equates to about 50 to 70 grams per day. So you want a diet high in healthy fats, moderate levels of protein, moderate. Now 50 to 70 grams, that is not a lot. That's a couple chicken breasts, uh, not a lot. But if you're an athlete, if you're pregnant, if, you're, if you have a lifestyle of, of a lot more activity, you're going to add about 25% to those needs, 25 to 50%. And transitioning to carbs, carbs is a very uh, interesting subject. People have a lot of conflicting information on carbohydrates, and I'm an avid believer in having a low net carb diet. Low net carbs, and that's not low carbs because you're getting plenty of carbs from vegetable, from fruit sources that have a lot of fiber. Net carbs is when you take the amount of carbs and you subtract the fiber. So any of those carbohydrates that are high in fiber, they don't do nearly the same thing to your body as refined carbohydrates with no fiber. 
more of your white breads and stuff like that. So you want a low net carb, but you can have a moderate level of um, fiber carbohydrates. And that's again, that's your fruits, that's your vegetables. And so there's two reasons why that you want high fiber with their carbohydrates, and that's because they're prebiotics. They see, they, they basically feed your healthy gut bacteria, and they also produce short chain fatty acids in the body, which again is used by your brain, by everything. And so when you're looking at this, most people do not know how to burn fat. And that's a big problem because if we, if we eat a diet full of refined, low fiber carbohydrates, we're gonna be solely burning only carbohydrates in our body. Because our body has never been trained to actually go after its fat stores. And we're gonna talk about that with intermittent fasting. Now, carbs are a dirty fuel. Fats are a clean fuel. Think of fats as like biodiesel. In fact, carbs, when you're using carbohydrates as energy, you're generating about 30 to 40% more free radicals as a byproduct than you would with fat. Now, I would be in favor of limiting your net carbs to around 40 to 50 grams per day. Remember, carbohydrates minus fiber. So you can have more carbohydrates than that, but if they have the fiber, you're able to subtract those and get your net carbs. Now, for grains, the grains is this, our human existence has been, been established, been involved for tens of thousands and thousands of years. The agricultural revolution only happened around 2,000 years ago. What that means is that since, ever since before the 2,000 years, we never grew mass fields of grains of any type of agricultural anything. They weren't mass produced like that until 2,000 years ago. So if you look at before, our bodies are really not made to eat all these grains and all these breads. So that food guide pyramid that the US government recommends is completely false. And so what to eat, we covered that, I told you the percentages, and now the second question is, when and how do I eat? And that's where I wanna talk about intermittent fasting. Because just like this, what do most people think they need to do when they eat? They think that I need to eat every two to three hours, small meals throughout the day, six small meals to keep my metabolism at its peak. Everyone's heard that. They're like, I, don't, I wanna avoid that starvation mode. So I gotta keep eating small amounts. Well, if that was true, how did, uh, how did the hunter-gatherers, how did our ancestors even survive? Because they didn't have grocery stores on every corner. They didn't have food available around the clock. In fact, what they did is that they, they cycled through many things of fasting, of no food, to periods of food. You know, if they had to go hunt, sometimes their hunting would take over 48 hours, and then they would catch some food, and they would eat a lot, and then they would go for a day or two or three without eating. So that cyclical periods of feast and famine are what give you these really good biomechan biomechanical, biochemical benefits to the body. And when you're looking at this here, when your body's using fuel, it first goes after its carbohydrates. It goes after the blood glucose, your blood sugar, and it goes after your stored blood sugar, which is glycogen. So your liver and muscles contain glycogen. So once we utilize our blood sugar, then our body goes after its uh, blood sugar stores, which is the glycogen. Once your glycogen is depleted, then and only then does your body go after its fat stores as energy. So if you're eating every two and a half to three hours, and you're constantly raising your glucose levels and your glycogen levels, how are you ever gonna get to your fat stores? And the answer is you can. You can absolutely not go after any type of your stored fat if you are constantly replenishing your blood glucose and your glycogen. You can't do it. And so intermittent fasting is not a diet. It's, a, it's a basically restricting your eating window to on an average, what I recommend is eight hours out of the day. So that means 16 hours out of the day, you're not eating. And if it takes around eight hours to utilize all your glycogen, that means that only eight hours after you consume your last meal is when your body's finally starting to go after its fat stores. So if you fast for 16 hours out of the day, that means that second eight hour time span is when your body's really breaking through its fat and starting to utilize ketones as energy. Ketones is uh, the byproduct of fat. So it's utilizing ketones, which is again, is a cleaner form of energy. You're generating way less free radicals, and it's actually most of your brain's preferred energy source is ketones. 
And so here, when they did, a, they looked at these animals with cancer and they found out that the only lifestyle intervention they could do that increased their lifespan by 30% was fasting. That was the only intervention they could do. And that was actually continuous fasting where they're doing it for about three days. Now, no one's gonna fast for three days or three to five days. No one's gonna do that. So then what they did is in the International Journal of Obesity, they came out with a study and they said that intermittent fasting where you restrict your eating window just throughout the day actually gives you similar, if not more beneficial benefits than continuous fasting. You know, and so fasting's been around for forever. You know, Ramadan, you know, different, uh, uh, what am I thinking, the Catholic one. Easter. Easter, you know. Lent, Lent. thank you, yes, yes. So these have been around for centuries, different fasting periods, and they give you a lot of health benefits. They did even, you know, Ramadan is probably the most natural intermittent fasting study they've ever, they ever could look at because in Ramadan, you're basically doing intermittent fasting for that entire time. You're not eating throughout the entire daylight time, which again, you're basically only eating for an eight hour period. And they did blood levels before and after. And I mean, the blood levels, you would think it's a different person after the series of Ramadan just by doing that, just by restricting your eating window throughout the day. So it's not saying you have to go days without eating. It's just saying skip one meal a day and only eat during eight hours. So instead of waking up and having a huge breakfast, eating throughout the day until dinner time, skip either dinner or breakfast. That's the most easiest part. And for me, I like to go to bed fairly satiated. So I would say go to bed more, uh, I would say skip breakfast, so that way you can have a good dinner at night and it's easier to go to sleep. I don't know about you, but if you're ever trying to go to bed hungry, it kind of sucks. I don't know. Um, so the health benefits. Now I'm just going to read these to you. You're going to normalize insulin sensitivity. You're going to boost your mitochondrial functioning. That's your energy sources of your cells. It's going to increase growth hormone massively, lower inflammation, lower blood pressure, lowers your fat levels. Even though you're eating a diet high in fat, you're going to actually lower triglycerides. You're gonna shed unwanted fat, you're gonna reduce oxi oxidative stress, that's from the less free radicals. You're gonna, have, you're gonna live longer. They actually showed you actually live longer by implementing intermittent fasting, and you're gonna increase brain function. So here what we're gonna do, I'm gonna take about a couple of the most common benefits, and we're gonna go over those in detail. And the first one's gonna be the fat burning. Because again, like we talked about, if glucose it takes six to eight hours for that glucose and that glycogen to rid itself from the body, after a meal, you have to extend your fasting period after that so you can start hitting your fat stores. Now, this way, say that I'm gonna skip breakfast and my first meal of the day is gonna be at lunch. So I start eating at 12, my last meal is around eight o'clock. So I'm eating for only eight hours out of the day. Then I go to sleep, wake up in the morning, not eating, right before I wanna eat my first meal of the day, Say you did an exercise. Say you uh, did some strength training. Well, your strength training, strength training with 16 hours of fasting in you. You have no recent consumed meal. You have no glycogen, no blood glucose there. So your body's gonna be forced to, to use massive fat as energy because you're increasing your metabolic demand from the workout and you have gotta use those fat stores. So your body has no choice but to drastically break down those fat stores, turning them into ketones for that energy during your workout. So working out in a fasted state is actually very, very beneficial. The most important meal of the day is actually after your workout. So in terms of human growth hormone, intermittent fasting has been shown to increase up to 2,000% of human growth hormone in men, about 1,300% in females. So that is huge. You can't get that from a synthetic injection. You can't do that from anything except intermittent fasting. And human growth hormone is the big one. That's your longevity hormone. That's your uh, healing, growth, repair, anti-aging. That's what keeps you looking you know, young, vibrant, uh, healthy skin. Human growth hormone is where it's all at there. And if you can increase that by 2,000%, that's crazy. 1,300% in females, that, you cannot find that. So just for that reason alone, you should be doing intermittent fasting for sure. Now, Brain function is probably one of my favorite ones because there's a substance called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And by utilizing intermittent fasting, you're increasing that substance by about 400%. And that BDNF is basically growth hormone for your brain. 
It's what uh, is responsible for neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is making new brain cells. So if you're increasing BDNF in your body, you're actually increasing your production of brand new brain cells. You're giving them massive memory, learning. When you have BDNF, one of the areas it acts on in the brain primarily is your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is deep in the temporal lobes, which has to do with memory, concentration, everything. So if you're increasing BDNF, you're actually increasing the size of your hippocampus and you're increasing your memory, learning potential, and brain cells. So that's a whole lot of stuff right there. But again, BDNF is one of the probably, there's so much research coming out in the last five years about BDNF that you cannot ignore it. And there's only three proven ways that increases the substance. And that's intermittent fasting, high intensity, weight training, and curcumin. Only three things have actually been proven over and over again to increase this substance, which is basically growth hormone for your brain. And just as a little sidetrack, I want to talk about curcumin for a second because this is too important just to uh, dumb down because curcumin, the active ingredient in turmeric, has literally been shown to be able to cross your blood brain barrier. And it actually doesn't just increase BDNF, but it increases dopamine. It increases serotonin in your brain. And again, in terms of effectiveness for an antidepressant, it's the exact same as Prozac. All the studies show that. There's no difference between Prozac and the people that just had a, about a tablespoon of curcumin every day. No difference. And so here, this study shows right here, this is out of brain research, that chronic stress basically downregulates BDNF. So if you're under chronic stress, you're going to have lower levels of BDNF. And it's also going to cause shrinking of your hippocampus and your frontal cortex. But then the last part, if you are, if you're, um, if you're consuming daily turmeric um, for about, you know, around a tablespoon a day, you're actually going to reverse that entire process. You're going to reverse that decrease in BDNF by massively stimulating it. And you're also going to increase the size of your hippocampus because turmeric can go through the blood brain barrier. That's very, very important. There's not a lot of things that usually that barrier is restricted for anything to go through. Well, curcumin, the active ingredient can go through it. And then here, Curcumin resulted, again, an increase in hippocampal BDNF, and it's an effective and lasting natural antidepressant. So again, if you are doing intermittent fasting, if you're doing high intensity weight training, if you're consuming turmeric, you're going to increase BDNF, which again, growth hormone to your brain. So it's going to restore normal brain functioning. You're going to have better memory. You're going to have more recycling and rejuvenation of your brain tissue. You're going to have neuroplasticity, the making of new brain cells. And that, in turn, is going to completely slash your risk of any type of depressive symptoms, any type of anxiety symptoms, anything like that, because it's all about changing the brain. And so how I consume turmeric personally, you have to add black pepper to it, because that increases its absorption by about 2,000% pepperine. So you also want a source of healthy fat in there as well. So I would make a smoothie where you're doing, uh, you're for sure adding the black pepper, and you're adding a little bit of coconut oil. From there, I just kind of add some cinnamon. I add a frozen banana and frozen berries to kind of make it taste a little better because it is kind of a spicy smoothie, if you will. I mean, black pepper and curcumin in a smoothie, it's, it's different. <laughs> Julia would love it, I'm telling you. And an optional is to add some superfoods into that smoothie as well. But those, that way, you're doing one of the proven methods to increase that growth hormone in your brain to make sure you have a long, healthy brain for life. And so. Another benefit besides the brain functioning of intermittent fasting is it, it massively increases insulin sensitivity. And the reason is, if you look at this diagram here, the diagram on the left shows that this is a normal insulin response, where if you eat a diet, if you eat some food, you're going to release a little bit amount of insulin, and you're going to cause all this glucose to go into your cells. When you're insulin resistant, you're going to have the same amount of blood sugar in your body, but your body needs to raise a ton of insulin to even try to get that to work because your body stops responding to the small levels of insulin. It's like if you hear a barking dog noise, after a while, if that noise is still there, you start to kind of zone it out. However, if you hear it, then you don't hear it for a day, and then you hear it again, all of a sudden you're very responsive to it. And that's why intermittent fasting is so promising with increasing insulin sensitivity is because if you're going 16 hours without eating, your blood sugar is way down and you're not releasing insulin. 
So that way, if you're only releasing insulin sparingly during your eating period, it's, your body's gonna be way more responsive to that. And insulin resistance basically leads to every single chronic disease out there. Heart disease, cancer, everything. So if you can improve this part of your body, you're gonna improve everything else. Now here, the three different fasting plans, there's actually more, but that I would recommend is there's one called the 5-2 intermittent fasting plan. And that's basically where you fast for the full day twice a week. And you can pick what days you want to do it. Another one is alternate day fasting, where you're basically fasting the entire day, alternate day, every other day. I'm a big fan of number three. And that's where you, can, you apply it every day, but you're just restricting your eating window. Because again, the only reason why we ever thought breakfast was the most important meal in the first place is because of breakfast food companies doing their advertising campaigns. I, I'm not kidding, if you actually go to the Quaker Oatmeal website and you look at their timeline of events, and I think it's in the mid-1800s, they say, released a massive, uh, massive advertising campaign to show the importance of eating breakfast. Because what does that do? It makes, them, makes people purchase more oatmeal, more cereals. So it was never based on science that you need a fat breakfast in the morning, even though everyone thinks that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Not true. So my personal routine, again, is I skip breakfast. I have an eight hour eating window. Not gonna lie, I, it, it's, it's been hard to abide by that on the cruise. But, you know, vacation, vacations you can maybe splurge a little bit, but moderate levels of protein, lots of healthy fats, minimizing non-fiber carbohydrates. And it takes about two weeks to do this to shift your body into fat burning mode. Because once your body can shift into fat burning mode, that's when you're gonna take the inches off the waist, that's when you're gonna make all those changes you want. And, I do it every day, again, for consistency. I found that people doing the 5-2 plan where they do like two days out of the week, they don't stick to it. You need something consistent on a daily basis that kind of ingrains into your body what you should be doing. And again, if you're pregnant, if you're a child, I would not do intermittent fasting because at those certain times, all you really should care about is just getting healthy nutrition for growth and development. And especially if you're pregnant, you know, you're, trying to, you're feeding another one as well. So, I wouldn't recommend a fasting plan for those two populations specifically, but everything else, it's fair game and it's highly encouraged to do so. And so, in the morning, I skip breakfast. Organic coffee, organic tea is completely fine because it has no calories or very minimal, but has no carbohydrates. So it's not gonna spike your insulin levels. And one thing you can do, and that's, this is what I do personally, is I add a little bit of gra grass-fed butter and a little bit of coconut oil to my coffee and I blend it up in the morning. And what that does is that that's pure fat sources. So it has no carbohydrates to increase insulin. So I can effectively still be in my fasting period by doing that. And by doing that, you're giving your body these easily digestible fats, especially your brain, to maintain its energy during that new eating program that you guys are gonna be starting out with. So sometimes if you're, if you're just gonna start this right away, you're gonna be a little hungry in the morning. You know, you're, you're gonna be used to having that breakfast the first thing in the morning. When you go without it, this coffee with the, or you can do it with tea or anything, those easily digestible fats are gonna kinda help your brain kinda get by with that little energy boost in the morning. And that's what I like to do. And so, again, when you combine intermittent fasting with your workout, and you start to work out and do your exercise program in a fasted state, you're gonna completely magnify all the benefits we just talked about. And I love it, we have to end with this little thing. It sounds crazy. You know, fasting, <laughs> fasting while you're exercising. But again, it only sounds crazy if you haven't tried it. Once you try it, you'll know what it's all about. And all my references are here. Appreciate you guys. Thank you.